Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. This is part two of my PhD student experience so far. Last time, in case you missed it, I covered my PhD application, the lead up to my PhD and the first couple of months getting started with my PhD work, literature review, starting my YouTube channel and everything like that. This is going to be part two, which is going to cover the rest of my first year of my PhD. So I really hope that you enjoy this series so far. If you do, be sure to give it a thumbs up. That really helps me know that you're enjoying this type of content. After this video then, there will be future videos coming around the second year of my PhD, which will be including a really big review that I had to do as part of my PhD, and also getting involved with the second research question as part of my PhD and doing a lot of work around that. A lot of different talks that I've gotten a chance to do as part of my PhD now especially with the YouTube channel starting to pick up that bit more and also of course my PhD student internship that I did just a couple of months prior. Be sure that you subscribe and hit the notification bell down below so that you can stay in tune for these upcoming videos around the second year of my PhD and my experience so far and then in years to come of course my third and fourth year experience as well. So semester two of my PhD during that time I did take a couple of classes so I took one class in academic writing for science and I took another class in contemporary software development. I thought the first class obviously would be really good to take for academic writing. Um, it's not something I had much experience with. My undergrad and even my masters didn't include a huge amount of writing or at least any classes where we really learned how to write properly. So I thought that this would be a really good class to do. I definitely feel like it was a good class to do. I think it's a great class to have on my CV as well, especially if I'm going to be going into research more. I think it's good to have a class like that on my transcript. However, I find I don't necessarily use as much of the things that I learned in practice when I'm writing papers. That's just more of, I think, of a habit thing that I need to get into the habit of really going back and editing properly the way that I learned in that class because I did learn a lot of valuable skills, but I just don't necessarily always put them into practice. The class in contemporary software development then I thought would be good to do because I have a lot of programming knowledge and I've taken a number of classes in programming. I can program in C++, Java, Python, um, JavaScript, you know, a number of different languages and even the sort of statistical ones as well, as well like OR and SAS and everything. And a lot of the Python knowledge that I know at least is more so self-taught and I find that my actual knowledge of computers and just general software development of what is a good way to write your code is very poor. So I thought that this would be a good class to do to learn about what are the things that when you're developing software people look out for as things to fix or bad things that you do. And I found out that there's a lot of stuff that I do when I program that is very, very frowned upon in a software development world. So if there was gonna be other people looking at my code, they would be probably disgusted by some of the things that I've done but it's more so about like whether things work for me. And now I'm at the stage where I'm trying to really, really improve my code quality a lot more and really, really be very harsh on myself to try and get my code up to a better standard. Learning about at least how to refactor your code and how to review your code, that was a really great class for that. I found it very, very challenging, but in the end I got an okay grade and I, I learned a lot and that's the main thing. In terms of classes that I was sort of doing teaching assisting with, I think I was just doing, I was doing one class but it had a master's version and an undergrad version so it was technically two classes that I was doing teaching hours for. I haven't TA'd any class yet which basically means that you're the head teaching assistant who would answer all the emails and really be in charge of everything. I haven't quite done that yet for two reasons. I think I'm a little bit nervous and then also I don't like emails so I don't really want more of them coming into my world. But I think it's, it's obviously something I'm gonna have to do soon and I, I'm gonna intend to do some this year, but we'll see. At the moment, I'm really happy just doing the demonstrator hours, which essentially means that you're more of a helper in the labs. So you'll go around, if anybody needs any help, they'll raise their hand, you go, you try to fix their code or help them learn to fix it themselves. And as well, that usually comes with some grading responsibilities. So and um, grading either assignments or exams depending on the class. So that was what I did in terms of those hours. For me, they're not a requirement, but I do think they're really good to do because obviously it builds your teaching and leadership skills, but it's also really good if I intend to go into academia, having those skills as well are really good. In terms of actual research then, 
Um, my supervisor and I sat down, I think maybe mid-January, I want to say, and he said that it would be great to get the ball rolling and really get in a paper pretty quick. So there was a conference coming up called the International Conference of Case-Based Reasoning. It was one that he had some experience publishing in before and he thought it would be a great idea to get started with some work. So he gave me some guidance for the first project and essentially what we're going to be working on was trying to predict somebody's marathon finish time based on their previous training plan. So for the 16 weeks before, before the marathon, all of their training data that we have from wearable sensors um, like Fitbits, we would be using that training information to try and predict their marathon time. And while my supervisor did have a similar paper before using previous race times to predict future race times, so we had a sense that this would be a good paper for that conference and that it would fit in well. And he had also, thankfully, quite a clean version of the data still raw training data in in a way that it has the 100 meter intervals and everything and I still had to convert all of those into the features and he definitely left me to do pretty much all of it by myself except for if I had any difficulties um, in terms of programming which he was always there to help with if needed but there was no sort of notebooks to take and learn from it was definitely a good learning experience for me to just figure out how to really work with that type of data um, and get it to a level that it was possible to do our machine learning work with. And of course he was there for plenty of guidance for what types of features to extract. So by that I mean what types of things in the data that we were looking for. So what elements of the training would be interesting to look at. So we took things like the total weekly distance, the total number of sessions per week and all of that type of thing. So he was able to give a lot of guidance and my other supervisor who was more involved in the sports science was also able to give a lot of guidance about what types of things we should look for. Um, and also based on previous literature where that has been studied in more of a sports science context, that all sort of informed the, the feature development process. And then in terms of the modeling, we used a previous approach that had been used for a previous paper using case-based reasoning. But again, I had to figure out how to implement all of that, which was such a great experience. And I feel like that was the time where I learned so, so much. And it gave me a lot of confidence, I think, in pursuing the work in later times because I had gotten all of that experience of figuring out how to work with this data, figuring out how to do this type of modeling at a really early stage. And then the deadline for the paper, I think was maybe, it was either mid February or late February. And then it got extended, I think by a week or so. We only had really about four weeks to work on this. So a couple of weeks to get all of the programming done, a couple of weeks to get all of that sorted. And then a week maybe two weeks for the write-up and my supervisor was really great with helping with the writing process for this first paper because I really didn't have a sense of where to get started with this type of work initially um, and I think working with him closely on this first paper really really helped me to develop my skills in writing just figuring out just how to take everything that's been done from the program and the modeling into a written format so I really, really appreciated all of that work in those first couple of weeks. I think it just gave me so much information and so much working knowledge. So we submitted that paper, I wanna say, thinking it was the first week of March, just about. And then I took a bit of a break after that. So I think that's usually what I would try to do if I have stuff like that coming up, where we have a paper trying to get in. Usually there's a lot of long nights in the process to a paper being submitted and working weekends as well. There'll be a lot of just last minute things that you end up needing to do. I remember this is something that still happens to me and I'm trying to figure out how I can avoid this happening. But I remember there were so many times where I had produced the graphs, sent them to my supervisor. He had some little things to change because he would have a much better sense of me of how graphs should look. I'm not a very visual person. I feel like I can like read the paper and understand and I don't really spend that much time looking at the graphs usually, but he would have a much better sense of that. So there were so many iterations of the graphs and it just was one of those things when sometimes it can take a while to run things. So anyways, there was a lot of late nights. There's a lot of long weekends. So I think once the paper was submitted, I took a little bit of time afterwards. This was just, I think mid-March was just when the pandemic was really hitting in Dublin. And we were actually meant to go to Italy at that time. So I had actually booked in a holiday for after that paper. 
but we cancelled that holiday. We ended up going to Belfast for a few days. I think we only had maybe like a couple, a handful of cases here. And just before we went to Belfast, all the schools closed. And then when we came back, pretty much everything was closed and we were in lockdown full on from then. The time in Belfast was so lovely. I'd actually love to go back and do it all again. It was so, so nice. I think I hold it very highly because it's still, it's the last thing I've really done since um, the pandemic. So those few days were so, so nice. I really, really, really enjoyed them. When we came back then, it was full on pandemic. The cases just started to explode in Dublin and we went into a full lockdown then pretty much and that was proper like everything was closed you all know the way and that lasted for a few months at least the first one so that's when working from home became a thing for my phd working from home was really interesting i actually personally really like working from home even still i still like working from home i actually worked down in this area of my house so you would have seen this in a lot of videos at the time we had a little dining table set up in here and I used to just set up my workspace down in this area. And we had just gotten this part of the house uh, redone. Literally, I think a week before the pandemic started, like a week before lockdown, this whole area was still being done and we didn't have a kitchen. Um, I think we were so lucky that it, it happened when it did because we had just gotten a kitchen and if we didn't have a kitchen for... A long period that would have been really bad i think the, the whole remodeling process took two months already so we had been living in tight quarters of the living room with like a plug-in stove top and everything like that so i think we were pretty lucky that we were able to have this space for that time so i was able to work down here and pretty much undisturbed obviously it's right beside the kitchen so that meant that there is a lot of people coming in and out throughout the day and there was four of us living at home at the time so definitely was in some ways getting it interrupted a bit. It was a time when the weather was starting to become a lot better and in this area it can be so nice and bright. That's why I'm filming in here this morning. And I do think it was a really, really nice time. So I finished out my classes. Um, I had to finish up all of the work for those two classes that I was taking and for the two classes that I was doing teaching hours for, which was a very strange experience. The first time trying to do teaching hours online and trying to help students online it was really really difficult it got a bit more normalized the second year but the first year it was definitely a real challenge and i think maybe after a month of getting settled into working from home i felt that it was a good time to maybe think about switching up the research so we decided to try a slightly different approach to before and changed up some of the work and definitely for this next section we focused more on the recommendations that went along with the prediction of the marathon time. I really wanted to target the conference recommender systems or Rexis and I asked my supervisor if he thought that would be a good idea and he said yes. So we decided to go for a short paper and we worked on that. So I worked on developing the recommendations and trying to make sure obviously it needed to be a different paper to the one before. It definitely built on the work we had done in terms of the marathon performance prediction, but we did change up a lot in terms of how it was modeled. And the model that we ended up with was a lot more explainable because it only used one, it only used single weeks at a time to generate the recommendation. So it meant that we could really point to individual runners that we had the, the work coming from. So we wrote a short paper, got that into Rexis, I think for mid-May, I wanna say it was. It could have been end of May actually by the time. I think most things got pushed back a good bit. So I think it was end of May that we submitted. And by that point I was finished with all of my classes as well. Another thing that happened during that time was that I applied for a startup competition with another PhD student friend of mine called Courtney. So we got into this competition, which then took place in the summer. So moving on to the summer of the first year of my PhD. The first four weeks of it were spent on this startup competition that me and my friend Courtney applied to and got in. So the idea that we had for the startup competition, basically because I had already been building up my YouTube channel around productivity and being productive during PhD. This was definitely an area that I was really, really interested in. And my friend Courtney, we had had a couple of conversations before about different productivity books. So we were both quite interested in it. And we decided to have our idea based around a productivity app, especially because it was a time when so many people were working from home. So many people were struggling with 
how they could stay productive working at home and everything like that. So we felt like it was such a hot topic. We honestly had really no full sense of what this product would look like. We just knew what area we wanted it to be in. So we submitted that idea in, I think, April and got into the program. And then we had a four week entrepreneurship course. This course was amazing. I highly recommend if anyone's in UCD, do try and do the Nova UCD student enterprise competition because it's such a great experience. You learn so much from people who know a lot, people who are involved in that area. So there's a lot of different um, workshops around entrepreneurship and building a startup and building a product. And during the process, you will build, you'll build up your idea. So you'll spend some time trying to talk to people in your customer area, uh, learn, trying to learn as much as possible from people who are struggling with those ideas. So because of the time that it was, we were able to share on Instagram different polls and reach out to people in the DMs and find out what specific issues people were struggling with and how we might be able to overcome those, what kind of things people were trying, what kind of things people weren't trying, what kind of things people would be open to, and just spent a lot of time sort of working on the idea. We eventually decided that sort of a web application would be best because if we have people using their phones, they'll be getting distracted from their work. So we decided to go for a web application and specifically to start focusing on personalized productivity because we felt that everyone's issues were so different and if you were to just make a one size fits all product it wouldn't necessarily work for everyone and that's something that I find as well with different productivity books one thing will be great for one thing and another thing will be great for something else but if you have one specific issue only one of those books is going to work for you so that's something that we really started to hone in on and start to to work on and we got to a really good stage we built a prototype we built um sort of a quiz to go along with our idea and we were able to do some sort of workshopping with people to show them our prototype, work out any issues and really get some good customer feedback. And it was such a great time. I really value that time. I feel like it was so useful. There's so much that I take from that course that I currently bring in to building up the personal brand of PhD and productivity. I feel like I learned so much about business and I feel like that was such a great experience. So that was the sort of end of May Pretty much the whole of June, I think, was spent working on this. And at the end, we had to do a pitch. So we learned how to pitch our product and how to show that to potential investors. And we ended up coming second, which was great. We also got a little cash prize of a thousand euro each, which was amazing. Especially as a PhD student, you'll pretty much take any extra income you can get. So that was really, really great. And, you know, we did spend a bit of time working on that during the summer. And it was definitely a really great time to be working on that. It is something that we've had to sideline since just because of being really busy with uh, working on our PhDs. And for me, something else happened during the summer, which meant that I was unable to really spend much time working on this. So during the summer of but the first year of my PhD, the person who had been running the drama school that I worked for part-time and had been working with the school for six, seven years prior and had been a student of the school for now, I suppose, if I'm thinking total time, 15, 16 years, um, she actually passed away, which was a really, really hard time because I spent so much time talking to her. We, we talked pretty much on the phone every day. Basically, she had had an injury, had to go to hospital and got pneumonia and passed away. And it was very sudden. Uh, she was very old, but like she was very, very healthy and really very able. So it was a really, really hard time because there's so many people connected to the school who were unable to get involved around her funeral. And she would have been someone in Dublin who would be quite famous in the drama school world. So it was was one of those things that was publicized very heavily around the time because every newspaper had a big spread around her passing and she would have been very influential. I was able to get connected with a lot of people who I wouldn't have been connected with from the time, but it was definitely very, very challenging. And I had been promoted to director a few months before that. So co-director of the school, essentially being involved in the management of the school. And then with her passing, it then meant that I was and still am the only director of the school. So I run the entire business now. That is obviously a full-time job, which I do in my spare time. Since I wanna say June, July, I suppose a lot of the time over that summer, was was more so trying to we had to we had so many books and notes and like literally hundreds and hundreds and thousands potentially even of books that we had to take from her home and um, we were able to spend some time there as well which was nice but we had to 
clear out all of this material because it was literally decades worth of material that's been built up for the school that we then needed to store that we could then use for future classes and everything. I did take a bit of time in the summer to to process that and I think the summertime then I, I wasn't I didn't feel like I was doing a huge amount of PhD work because that was going on and I was trying to take on the management position of the school so that was quite difficult but during the summer as well I did present the work that I previously mentioned that we had submitted in sort of February. We presented that at the International Conference of Case-Based Reasoning. So that was my first real presentation as a PhD student. And it was a 20 minute presentation with a 10 minute Q&A. I also, for that same conference, had submitted a doctoral consortium paper, which essentially is a way for you to present your research to a panel of people who are involved in a very specific area to do with your research and show them essentially your work to date and your planned future work and get some really good feedback from people who are heavily involved in that area. I would highly recommend everyone does a doctoral consortium at some point. I think it's so, so useful. Even if you have your own supervisors who are amazing, which I do, my supervisors are great. It's always great to get feedback from people who are sort of separated from your area, who are still involved in the general research area, but who aren't super in the area of your PhD because I think everyone can get up end up in this sort of box where you're not really quite seeing if there could be an issue of some description. So doing the doctoral consortium event was really great. And again, I think that was more of a, maybe a 10 minute presentation and a five minutes Q and A. And that was such a great experience. Um, I met so many great people at that conference. It was around the time when I was still sort of grieving quite heavily. So I didn't get to really experience much of the conference in terms of the social events or anything like that. And it was also online. So I still haven't been able to go to an in-person conference. I'm hoping that will happen this year, but so far it's all online. The rest of the summer then was spent, again, com coming back to reading up papers. So I, at this point, I'm now managing the drama school evenings and weekends, and I'm doing my PhD work sort of in the morning and in the afternoons. And then at, at times I can work on the YouTube channel when I have time, but a lot of the time I do end up having to take times out of the YouTube channel because now it's sort of third priority after these two things. I think I didn't, I don't think I posted much at all over the summer. The rest of the summer then was mainly reading papers and really starting to write up some of the work that I've been doing. We also submitted a journal paper, which I was a co-author for and had contributed in terms of one of the case studies that was included in the paper. So it was all around the general area of sort of machine learning in, in marathon running. And given that there was a few other people working in that same area in the research group, there was different case studies of new work and old work. And so some work that had been shown before and some that hadn't involving both of, of the groups. So my work focused as one of the case studies, I think it's only just been accepted maybe a few months ago. So I'm now considering that a second year paper and not a first year paper, even though it was based on my first year work, it's being considered as a second year paper just because it has only really just been accepted uh, towards the middle of my second year, I think. The last thing that happened in first year was that I started to work on a collaboration with another universe, with two other universities actually, around a project involving fitness prediction. So my professor had done a paper before where they had estimated fitness variables from marathon training data. And now the idea was to bring in some more sports science people to actually do some lab-based measurements and do some trials to actually measure the fitness var variables as they would be measured in a lab setting. And then to do the work around um, the actual prediction based on the training and to see how actually accurate it was compared to the real deal, basically. So this work has been ongoing throughout the last year because it takes a lot longer to get all of that lab-based information. We have sort of one runner coming in every couple of months so it does take a while to get all of that information especially with the pandemic occurring there being a bit of a delay in general and that's with a university in the UK called the University of Herefordshire I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right and a university in Auckland called Auckland University of Technology in New, Ze in New Zealand so we're collaborating with those two universities on that work and that so we had our first sort of initial meeting I think at the end of the summer 
and we've had a few meetings since then and I've done some of the work since then in second year. Another thing that happened in the summer of first year, I think in June or July, my channel here on YouTube got monetized. So what that means is I now had ads on my videos and I started to generate a little bit of income from the channel. I think the YouTube ads only takes in around two or 300 euro a month, which obviously it's so much compared to just my PhD stipend. It adds such a nice little extra bit of spending money. So I'm so, so thankful for that, but it's it's not a huge amount. So if anybody's thinking about getting into it, my, my income for it, for the ads at least, is still around the same even a year later. So if you're thinking you're gonna get rich quick, uh, that definitely won't happen, but it's definitely worthwhile in terms of all of the other opportunities that come with it. We'll, we'll get in, I think, a little bit more into that in the next video. I think by the end of my first year, I had maybe four or 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. I think it's worthwhile. It just definitely takes some time and some effort, but it is definitely worthwhile. It seems like so much when you look back at it all. Honestly, I think a lot of first year, you're spending that time thinking that you're doing nothing. <laughs> it feels that way anyways. There's so many days I think where you think you really should be doing more or you're not quite sure what to do. But when you look back at all of the things, it's honestly, it's a lot. It really is a lot. So everyone, that is it for part two of this series. So finishing off the first year experience of my PhD so far. So we saw all about my real first time getting started with the PhD work, the classes that I took, the classes that I was sort of helping with the teaching, obviously the pandemic hitting and me having to learn how to work from home, which was a huge thing, basically changed the sort of course of my PhD a little bit. Next video, we're going to be covering all about my second year of my PhD, which includes my stage two transfer, which is this big review that happens at some point in the first two years of your PhD. We're gonna be talking about a second, work on a second research question. We're talking about me hitting a massive roadblock in my PhD in terms of motivation. We're also gonna be talking about doing my PhD internship as well. And we're gonna be talking about my plans for the next two years, potentially, if the video isn't too long or else that'll become a separate video as well. So if you want to see that video, be sure you've subscribed, be sure, sure that you've hit that notification bell and turned it on to all notifications so that you don't miss that video. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks to all of my wonderful members and I will see you all in the next video.